so my name is Aaron Risto. I'm with the American Farmland Trust and the Ag Stewardship uh, Program. So um, I'm just going to leave it up here for now. And then I know most of you already know all about the Genesee River Demonstration Farm Network. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, highlight the three farms that we're going to highlight today. Um, actually, there's four because I just realized I didn't put Don's in there. So Don's up in the upper left. Uh, a green there that's not colored, but the other three are, are what we're highlighting as well along with bones today. So then uh, just to remind you of all the farms, so a few of the folks here are uh, in the crowd, um, but we're going to have three uh, silage farms uh, results from planting green. So um, there's one in Oakfield and then the other two are in Castile. And then we have uh, two grain farms, uh, which is Don's one and uh, Jay's the other. I call that a crop farm, although uh, Jay is getting uh, dairy, uh, getting manure on some of his fields. And again, Table Rock is uh, is one here, and Jeffrey's in the crowd today. So if you have questions for him, um, he's here, and I'm sure he'd be happy to I'm volunteering him to answer anything. If you want to see him, maybe wave your hand, Jeffrey. Uh, but they have uh, 1,300 cows and about 1,800 acres uh, with corn silage, alfalfa, uh, and processing peas. Uh, they've been doing no-till for nearly uh, two decades, and they have been doing cover crops and nutrient management for quite some time as well. Um, although later they went, they um, introduced uh, their cover crops uh, became more of a mix than a single species. And then we have the Ram Farm that's in Oakfield, um, and they are about 4,000 cows and nearly 10,000 acres. Uh, they're doing strip till uh, with cover crops and, and nutrient management. And by the way, um, the Table Rock has a new case study out for their economic analysis. Um, so that's available on the Genesee River uh, Demo Farm Network site. Um, and we're working on lambs right now and, and pan cows. Um, but uh, so, so we do have pan cows uh, results in here as well, which are also in cast style. And uh, they have corn, alfalfa, and a forage cocktail mix. They're about 850 cows and uh, 1,350 acres with strip till cover crops and, and nutrient management as their soil health practices. And uh, we all know uh, Don as well, He, him and Chad, uh, farm about 1,500 acres uh, with corn grain, sweet corn, rye, processed vegetables, um, and all sorts of uh, soil health practices that he's been doing for several decades. And uh, same with Jay, who's also here today uh, with his uh, father and brother with uh, 4,500 acres, corn silage, corn grain, soybeans, sweet corn, uh, processed vegetables, and alfalfa. And again, a, a variety of uh, soil health practices that are being used. But all these farms are also planting green. And so that's what we're looking at. We uh, wanted to evaluate the performance of planting green uh, versus basically a, a no cover situation or a fallow situation. Um, and then just, a, I'll call it a conventional cover crop practice where you're pre plant terminating the cover crop. Um, and so we're looking at uh, six cover crop treatments. Uh, we're evaluating different ecosystem services, which we're going to highlight a few of those today. Uh, and then we have about uh, we're, we have two years of data, so we'll get one more year out of it. And just to remind you of the experimental design. Um, so we basically have six treatment, six um, treatments in here where we have a fallow treatment. So the, the farmer can, it's whatever they decide to do, they can leave it fallow if weeds grow in there, that's fine. Or they can choose to, to spray and, and control that. So in some cases, the fallow that you bear. Um, and then, uh, then we let the farmer rate, which was also decided by Dave. Um, so they picked a cover crop rate that they thought would work best in the field. And then we just doubled that rate for a few reasons. One, doubling it just meant to turn the planter around and it was easier to just double. Uh, but we also wanted to kind of take it over the top and, and see what the results were by just over overdoing it. So what we do is uh, you're going to see this a lot in the graphs coming up. There's a free plant and then a planting green set. So uh, right, right before they sprayed uh, the cover crop to, to get ready for planting, the pre-plant, we would go out and sample the biomass and we took uh, soil moisture and soil temperature, uh, set the biomass to the lab for analysis, um, and then right before they actually planted. So that, that burn down area is the, is the 
wider area in the center of the plot. So we just have the sprayer go down the middle. Uh, Dave came up with this design. It was really, uh, I think, very smart uh, in terms of being easier to implement. Uh, so we burn down that area, so then we go back and sample again in those two areas after the burn down. So the burn down area, obviously, the, the, the cover crop's starting to die back or is completely die back. And then the, the non burn down area is still growing, and that's what the, the green area is. And with that, I'll bring uh, Dave up to, to start his part of it. And actually, I'll have that mic now. Thank you. No emergencies. And then I'm just going to do the slides for you. Do you want to put the PowerPoint over here or not? No, do you mind looking? No, nope, that's fine. Yeah. No, Aaron, I got to give a lot of credit. This is a lot to manage to be able to do the chat, run this, the background, because when we do presentation, have people in the uh, remote coming in. We have three staff people doing this. He's doing it all at himself once. It's a real challenge, and I'd say that's a lot heavy, but but uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to work with Aaron and this project with American Farm. I trust. Um, I, I learned a lot from it. Uh, it's and it's interesting data because I think each year could be different how we make this work and when this is make this come along. So I'll go ahead and power ahead there, Aaron. We did something different too. We're also doing carbon uh, measure nitrogen. Uh, we also sample it three different times. Once in the fall, if there's enough there to cover out the harvest. Then we also do it in uh, just about end of April. We'll show a slide of that. And then mid May, just about when we're ready to plant into it for the plant green. But here's uh, the rainfall events that we had last year. And uh, if you look at the two years of weather data, and at the bottom there, you see the average as well. Over, I think that average was over like 12 years of rainfall data that was approximately. And uh, you can, that was the average of all the sites, but there's the rainfall that happened. But if you look at uh, Castell area, and it had like 20 inches of rainfall last summer in those three months. And last year it was just about 12 inches. And in the more north you got, this team definitely got a lot less um, during that last year. And then I asked Aaron, okay, I was thinking about the two years that we had. May and June last year, obviously, was very dry, but the year previously was pretty dry as well. What specifically happened is, well, the month of July, you can see the rainfall that happened last year, how much more greater than that was. It definitely even beyond the average. We had close to 10 inches of rainfall in the month of July. It was like monsoon Thursdays, which we got one of three, four inch rain events that came down really hard. And I want to show you here's the background of what was going on during that period of time as we move forward. Then you look at August, very similar weather pattern, um, not much. Maybe Castile area, we got a little bit more rainfall. But as a whole, um, it was close to normal. But do you think that month of July, there was a lot more rainfall event that happened during that period of time? Now, remember, I think there was rain events of like four inches maybe in one day or something like that. So, just something to keep it back in your mind as we move through this data. Uh, just some pictures of how we do the uh, treatments. Obviously, I look at the control section, I call that God's cover crop, that the chickweed and that we harvest, if there's something there to harvest. That goes into our that we measure for nitrogen and carbon. And then we also check the dry matters from that. We drop off a lab here in Batavia in the Cumberland Valley to get a test result back to it, see what the numbers are. Then um, you can see the temperature the moisture meter right there, and the temperature is measured it as well. So that's part of the data that we collect during that period of time. And then here's a plant green that we go ahead and harvest at, at that time. So this is actually from the table rock side that I remember. And the other Part of it, just keep in mind, this, this is a different level of cover in the field as we're out sampling. So the control, a little more bare than it had the pre plant um, dying out there, and then what the, the planting green looked like. Great. Here's the species that the farmers use. Uh, Table Rock does uh, you know, 30 pounds of rye and 30 pounds of oats, roughly. Land farms did a three way mix as well, 30 calicos and crisp clover. Tank house did it one single species at 60 pounds. So, this is the farmer's rate they use for their cover crop mixtures. And um, here's uh, the biomass that we measure from those different field farms. I think this is all 2022 data. This thing I, I saw last fall, remember fall that we had, we had a lot of not the greatest cover crop catches. Some of the cover crops we found out when we got in the spring did not catch that well. It was a terrible wet fall. It was a challenge to get planted. Both everybody got it planted, but then it was saturated for a period of time. 
They wonder that we had a lot of things that come up through. We had buried areas, live areas. I had one cover crop plot at Jeffries that we had beautiful biomass cover crop, but then everything died to have winter, even though we had live species. It was just kind of weird. So it's a lot of erratic catches. And if you look at the biomass measurements, different measurements there, like uh, Hill Rock, yeah, he had definitely decent growth there for the rye, but he went to lambs. There was not much growth that you look at versus the 21 data versus the 22. And then Pank House, um, when they did their, their rye, they planted well in October, like mid October, and they had very areas, some areas that were spread, but it was not the best crop development as we seen the year the previous year. Okay, um, what else do we got here? Is this available nitrogen in those situations? Uh, sorry, I you know what? I think something got um, out of order here. Just a second. Uh, nope, it didn't. Never mind. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Yeah, back to the nitrogen right here. This is a, we take a test of the protein, and the protein is converted to nitrogen. And I'll pick on Table Rock. Um, as the planting green, we got 90 units of nitrogen. We expect about only 45 pounds of that will become available for the crop. Okay, the rest of it's going to be realized maybe year two or year three as time goes on. Worst, if it's burned down the way ahead, we only got a 33 pounds from that. So that's one advantage about letting it grow. You get more biomass, you get more protein. And it covers the nitrogen could be for that crop as we go for in the as we go. Now, was it the 18 day average uh, between what was pre plant versus when it was burned out by the day? Okay, let's see. We'll get the slide now here. it's uh, 2021 20, compared to 2020. 20, 21 versus 22. Yes, you can see the 21 crop that was applying 12 20. We got a lot more consistently better catches. Much more better development, and you can see you got more definitely got more nitrogen. And that's one thing that's important to do is to measure these things in season before you terminate to kind of come up with a number of okay, what kind of nitrogen do I expect from the cover crop? So there's a variability in what kind of fall we have, what kind of seeds we have, and there's a dramatic difference from one season to another season. There you go. Ahead. Um, there we go. Yeah. Oh, is it jamming up there we oh, go. No. So right, right. Know, that's lamb and then lamb. Yeah, you see it, it's kind of consistently not as good as last year. Here's lambs. Um it decent responses in 21 for the 22 season. And then the next one is gonna be um tank house. Very consistent tank house of fine as much like the fall. But this year I'm kind of more excited about the catches look much, much better. A great fall for cover ground. I, I think I see a lot more was done, more timely, it was dry enough to get it going once you've got it. Uh, if you drilled it, obviously I like to drill better in broadcasting it because if you're broadcasting, you got to work it in somewhat. But the catches, even with broadcasting, instead of working in, it's coming up looking really much better this year. So I'm kind of more pleased with the cover crop trials look like this year. That's why it's good to run the state over at least three years. But I'm wondering if we should have more years and see what it's at, what the trend and how it changes from one season to another. So go ahead. Now we're into yield data. Yield data, okay. Okay, I'm going to slow this down a little bit. Um, Here's the three different farms right there. Uh, you can see, I'll, I'd like to, uh, you can see the burn down material as a whole. Seems to be a little bit better yield with a burn down ahead versus planting green later. Okay. I'll let you look at the trends there. Um, the one X there, I see a table rock at a high seal of the burn down uh, over the under trial. Where it is interesting with the tank house, where the two X we had better yield with uh, burn down versus the green. Um, but the trends are seem to be in the in the uh, big trends. Um, that we've seen that it seems like a little bit better yield with the burn down versus the green. Even though the biomass was not that huge, um, I think back we had a very dry year, especially in the month of July, that maybe the moisture from the cover crop maybe what. So most of the crop and it kind of affected the yield somewhat. So yeah, we'll look at this the three farm average. And here's the three farm averages. And we got the 21 and 22 season right there. And if you look at the 21 season, the best yield we had is the 1x cover crop by the green. Not by much, but you can definitely see a little bit better. And then the 2x by the green was prior for uh, the grouping there for the 21 season. Okay. And keep in mind the late planting. 
and the delay plan, of course, that's a factor of that too as well. So if we go to the 22 season, we need to average all three parts together, um, yield down, uh, which is typically for that yield in the whole of the region. We're down at least probably three, four times less than the year previous with the drought that we had. But you can see the burn out shape seem to be better um, with the burn out ahead. One thing I did notice, um, so you can think of the pre plant as kind of a conventional uh, termination timing for a cover crop that probably most of you are used to doing. But I did notice that that that, that burn down 1x cover crop treatment did do better than the control. Uh, so, we, we, and regardless of either year. So, I thought that was interesting that the cover crop treatment is showing um, the, the best fields, even in the wet year. Good point. Yeah, and then now we just do each farm yep. here. Okay. Yep. Okay, here's a, a little zip through these slides for the time. I think you're simply seeing the same thing. Um, 50, 25 pounds of 21 seeds in the fine green, which is great. It's not so bad. You go to next year, we're down two pounds less in the 22 season by the burn out ahead. Yeah. And uh, where are we at here? Those lambs. Yeah, you can see. The, the trends there. Um, actually, the burn down versus the one after two after three is maybe like a little bit better yield in that situation with the mountain. That was good to see. They had a three way species, keep in mind, they had clover in that next two as well. Um, and uh, you can see maybe it held, it didn't seem to be uh, retarded by the uh, planting green versus brown. No, the two X, see how the two X, you see the yields really drop down when we double the rate of cover ground, we definitely lost the yield in that situation. Uh, and here's the house um, and what they're sitting there. And um, uh, they were consistent brown versus green, except for the 2X of last year's data. And then this year, uh, pretty much near all the treatments, um, you can see that the what burned out ahead versus what's by green, we definitely uh, had a burn out, seemed to help a little bit better yield by a couple of times, maybe a ton and a half. So. Um. So I did spend a little bit more time than David staring at this to create these graphs. But the, the other thing I was going to mention is um, table rocks treatments were more um, what we were going for in terms of the treatment. You know, having these distinct, clear uh, levels of cover. Whereas you saw with the biomass and in, in lamb and pan cow that it was a little bit more. Uh, there wasn't as stark as differences. Um, so just keep that in mind because there actually wasn't a lot of cover difference, but then there were still these, there's quite a, uh, yeah, these trends. Right. So we move it forward. So next, then. Yeah, now we're going to the grain farm situation. Now the grain farm situation, they plant their cover crops much earlier in the season than my salad dairy. The salad guy harvest and typically are not able to plant the late right. September or October. These guys are doing after a winter grain. And uh, or you know, processing vegetables or whatever, and their system allows them to. So, this is why in like about early August, mid August situation. And Don is, if you remember from last year, he does uh, has a mix that goes right into where he's got to find his corn and some species that are going to die during the winter. So, it has a zone that's already kind of what they call biofill. And in between, you've got all these different species that he has. And I'm not going to look them all the different species. You can talk to Don about all the different mix to use. But they're all reduced rates. They all work together. They work in harmony. They make a different root structures. They lower development. And then when he goes into the plant in the fall and spring, it's a nice seed bed that, that's right there for him. And uh, it works out very well for him in any case. So, and here's the system of his, actually, his strip tail that's working in, in a ground running in good shape. You can see the line of species in between. They're there, but the species in between the rows are pretty much dead. And then that makes my uh, lead mill. So it's really unique that they set up the planting unit and the drill unit are the same width to make it work. And they, everything is under RGK, so we follow those, uh, those lines for the following year. So, and here's a picture of a uh, system that you can see. Um, you got to control the battle, the pre plant termination, and then we've got the plant green right next to it, replicated four times, and, um, and with a different. Uh, environments that we have of a different race seed that we put down for cover crops. Okay, um, biomass. biomass was 21 and 22. Um, you can see, again, it was, it was strange. I, I can't quite 
understand what happened, but I just seem like things that have over winter as well last year versus the year. So you can see the biomass between the two years, how much greater that was in our measurements. Near the areas where it's fair, there's not much growth. And uh and where the year previously, you could see a lot more pounds of material that we harvested from those plots up to close to three pounds of dry matter on the two X and then more than two pounds. But then you go to the following year, you're down to not even uh, have no realm half a ton. One thing you should make a back, we'll go back one slide real quick. And a plow area, that's actually just a dry. That was, there was no, it was a dry cover crop that was left from the new our control section. So that's why you got quite a bit of punish coming from the rye. And then the other ones are actually the cover crops that have gone by it. Okay, this is nitrogen credits from those different cover crops. And uh, it's like a third box of the trends, I would say. You know, 77 pounds out of you know, 26 pounds, so a lot of nitrogen coming from that. However, one thing we don't, we probably should have a slide of this. We did harvest it in the fall. And so what we harvest in the fall is still contributing nitrogen for the, for the crop of the fall year, right? So we gotta keep that in mind that we do have data on that too as well, but that will be way too much to look at for just a little bit of time to do this. Yeah. All right, and then here's our yield data. Um, if you look at last year's data, the parallel section where the rye was only, we had a, you know, roughly a five bushel less versus brown versus green. But then if you look at the one X, two X, how much separation you could have to the couple of bushels. And then the following year, the fallow versus the one X and two X. One thing I want to say about this, even though we had this trial as previous as replicated so many times, I think there's a lot of variability in yields this year is going across that field. I know Chad and I were talking about that. There's places that wherever that trial happened to be, there might be better water holding capacity. You might hit a null or whatever. And that's part of this factor that might drive the yield that we see here. It's not just because of cover crops and stuff like that. And I think there's variability in soil. And the variability in the soil really showed up a lot more than normal this year. And I think I've heard people when you're kind of like hit an old area, you might be down to 80 bushel, then you're down in the valley and the dip, you'd be over 200 bushel. So there's a lot of noise in this data, is what I'm trying to say about this. But you can see the yields on uh, green versus uh, what was terminated earlier, um, except for the 2x, pretty low. But then you look at the 1x, uh, what was terminated earlier versus what we harvested, it's quite a different yield. And then the fallow versus the green is quite a difference as well. And now that you mentioned that, uh, this, the 2021 versus the 2022 trials for Dawn were actually in different fields. So that might have been, you know, the first the, the first field may have, may have been more consistent throughout the field and where the plots were. So that could be an issue. And same with uh, pan cows and uh, pan cow was also in a different field. Lamps and the table rock were in the same field. Good point, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Now, then we're just going to finish up with Jay. Yeah, now we'll go back to Jay's uh, farm. Um, this is after weed as well. Planted, I don't know, Jay. Late August. Late August. Late August was planted. There's a mix from King Agassi and Rob will tell you. I don't know the name of this, what the mix is called. But you can see the grains and then all the different species that goes into that blend of what their percentage is. It's right there. So it's quite a mix. It was not uniformly with the drill, I'm assuming. Uh, broadcast and I'll show sure you real okay. Yeah. yeah, and then you can see the rate that was applied. And this is just what it looks like. This is what it looks like right here. Uh, with no cover, uh, all the till system. Then when they pre plant they went the whole length. I don't know how big this trial was. You know, roughly how many acres this trial was? Uh, 20 or so. 20 acres. So it's replicated at least three times, I believe, four times. And uh, it's 20 acres of size, and uh, you can see the green versus the termination and stuff like that. And uh, the what he terminated was right after it was, it was, the picture was taken at 16 years old. It was planted, I'm sure it was planted straight right away after that. Yeah. Actually, in this picture, you can see it, and he actually had this planted, and I put one out there. But uh, th th this trial, you're about to see some results here, but th this trial was slightly different than what I showed you uh, the setup. There wasn't a 2x rate, there was just a 1x. So there's no like uh, rate difference. Uh, so it's a little simpler results. Yep. And here they are, here they come. 
and then we'll add the yields and if you're aware that's fine I think specifically that's probably not much better so out of that if you go to according to planet green you definitely saw more loss and yield in that situation but I was talking to a grower that's into this planet green and planet brown said if I want to I'm looking at the long term I mean yes I might suffer some yield loss by planet green in those dry years but I look at it this way. If I get one of those ridiculous corn nests with four or five inches of rain, which we seem to commonly have once in a while, I got something to protect my soil. So, what's the penalty of that having it protected in our armor properly versus something that that's brown? You find into it and it breaks down too easily, then you get that big storm in June. I look at it that way too, as well. Also, I know if I continue this practice over time, over time, I'm going to develop more organic matter. This way, I'm going to be developed more. So in all practices, I think I can work. It's worth the need to take the yield off for some years, knowing long term I can improve that soil to make it better for me in the future. I thought it was an interesting comment. I was still talking to a grower about that. So some things you got to think about. Yes, there's risk. There's more management. There's more things to come in play of this. But however, I got to look at the cost and benefits of what I'm looking at down the road. But I just. I still, I think the risk of yield loss when you lose 10 bushels or a ton of, a couple tons of corn silage, that's significant. And uh, that's something you have to think through to see if it's that worth doing the system. So, okay, we're about to finish up here. Yeah. Uh, I love this photo. This is something Jason post cold for me. Um, did this March 1st last year. And you can see a little bit of green material now. I could point that out or point it for me. but. Right in that area, there's a little bit of cover crop growing, which almost like chickweed, but right in front, you can see it's not much there because the plant is so late in the fall. But you see where the snow is? There's different sections. There's about four different sections. That's a check trip right there. So no cover. No cover at all, except maybe a little bit of chickweed. That little bit of biology warm up the soil, and now the soil melts and put in no more moisture into the soil profile. I just think that a little bit of biology with that difference that it does for that soil is really interesting when I look at this hole. So. And then did you want to talk about the glyphosate? Yeah, we have time to talk about that. Well, we a little bit. One thing I'm going to say about the bottom screen, a little bit of probably the nutrition acquire. I get a little concerned about the banning of pesticides, things like that, you know, about buying banning glyphosate, banning neodex, stuff like that. My opinion, we need these technologies to make this work. I remember the days that we were using feed treatments to put in, into the feed boxes, the three week treatment, and if stuff was blown and kind of farmers are covered with it, with all the materials. I don't want to, I don't want to go back to what we have, but what recently we went to the neonic and or used to glyphosate say is that it makes the technology work for us. And so I got we just gotta use it. Properly and judiciously, obviously, that's important. But we need these materials to make soil health work, is what I want to make a point about. And same with using Roundup. But anyhow, one thing I like about the system, this stuff, it will help reduce the use of Roundup by by green. You just spray it once and spray it twice, or maybe three times. And you guys do a burn down, they do something to replant, then you have to hit it again later because it's got leaf escapes. This system may allow you to do one application and allow us to then hopefully reduce to use the glyphosate. And use it one time instead of two or three times. So, and plus, now we look at the prices, we're down to sixty dollars a gallon, used to be fourteen. So, the break even price of uh, doing one application versus two applications used to be used to be two dollars a bushel. Now, it's up to four dollars a bushel based on price increases. And then, hopefully, get away with one treatment because you can do it right after planting. So, that's a good advantage about that. Let's move on to the next. And in nitrogen, uh, we don't want the nitrogen prices that we kind of pointed out earlier today. Um, and by having that biomass cover crops, we can get 30, 40, maybe 50 more units of nitrogen from that by have green. So that's a good badge about uh, letting it grow a little bit bigger and more size out of it. So moving on. Uh, and then finishing up. Yep, I think we are. And then um, key points I want to point out is definitely the low seeding rate, less than four. I got that kind of drilled my mind. Um, obviously, we know what's going to increase our organic matter. In a wet year, if we do a wet spring, this is going to really, really help us out to be able to plant sooner in that profile by drying out the soil and plant into it. We haven't had that in the last two years, but I don't want to curse with ourselves. But if we do have that wet year, this is going to help us dry out the soil. Don't burn it down yet. Let the cover ground help 
pick up that moisture and now the soil dry out more. Uh, the creating a mulch, um, that, the mulch is huge for runoff issues. And then obviously we kind of talk about the cloud state. I'm a big fan of the BioScript still that Don used. I think that's a great way of making this work quite well. And then the challenges, um, go to the next slide, is that the time of this um, time of spray here, and depending on the custom hard custom people that spray it for you, and you plant it, and if you don't get that spray right away, it comes up a week or two weeks later, you got a disaster on your hands. So using custom people when they're limited with you have limited amount of people working for both custom applicators. I don't know if this is suited for some farms or depending on custom application to do this system. We'd be better off getting a bird down the head instead of depending on custom people that come in here to do that. Um, also, we have that huge biomass that could cause some problems with miners. I think that's pretty common sense. And then, as a proof this year, uh, with the dry years, you can have a yield penalty because so much moisture is coming out of the ground and you can lose some yield. And then the carbon and nitrogen pile could be a factor. So, I think with that, we are not in my speaker. Then. Um, and a lot of folks coming together. And Aaron, thank you for putting this together for us. Uh, thank you. We'll uh, get questions after we get Heidi uh, in here. 